What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here, and a lot more people have been able to start being able to piece their computers out. Certain graphics cards have really started coming down in price. You can get AMD cards at just about MSRP at a lot of retailers now. I thought I'd give you guys a talking head piece uh, with a little bit of demonstration about outdated PC advice that you should just ignore. But not my advice, my advice is always sound and up to date. This video is sponsored by Micro Center and their custom PC builder. Use the custom PC builder to plan your next build, and when parts are added to your cart and in-store pickup is selected, you have the option for a Micro Center technician to fully build your PC for an extra fee. And if the order is placed at least four hours before closing, you can enjoy your new PC the very same day. Get the best prices and parts selection at any of Micro Center's 25 locations across the United States. And right now, new customers can get a free 128 gigabyte flash drive and a free 128 gigabyte micro SD card while supplies last, in-store only, and limit one per email. To see everything that Micro Center has to offer and to learn more about this limited time giveaway, click the link in the description below. First things first, ignore everything I have to say. That's, that's the first piece of advice you should ignore. No, um, I think one of the most common misconceptions that we have today is the fact that the stock coolers are garbage. Things have changed over the last five years, more so than I think we've ever seen in any five year progression of, of uh, technology and that being, the, the kinds of stock coolers that we have out there. Intel for the longest time came with a very basic little four pin, cop, uh, just aluminum heat sink like this with a fan on top. And they would even include it with some of their i7 models and this is predating i9 and we're going back to like Pentium, Pentium D, Core 2 Duo era, where it was enough to get you by, you could hook it onto your system, hook it on your motherboard, be up and running, and then anything beyond that, any severe workload on your system, the stock cooler just simply couldn't keep up. But as core counts have increased in CPUs and the density of the, the, the core architecture and the process has gotten smaller, with that, coolers had to get better. Uh, most Intel CPUs nowadays uh, don't come with a, a box cooler. However, AMD does still include box coolers with almost all of their processors with the exception of like 5900X and 5950Xs and Threadrippers and stuff, of course, because such high-end solutions would typically require a custom cooler. But anything more mainstream that's a little bit farther down the product stack with the efficiency of the IHS design or the integrated heat spreader, the thermal interface material between the heat spreader and the core itself have met a nice, uh, efficient transfer of heat from the core to the cooler. And you'll get different size coolers now. So you can see this guy is half the height in terms of the cooler. Look at the aluminum part, not just the fan, but the aluminum part of this guy over here. And that's because this is what would come with something like a uh, 1300X or maybe uh, if we talk about modern CPU, something like a 5600X or something like that, you would start getting a smaller um, heat sink like this. Now this actually comes from an old 1200G, I believe it was. Um, you can see there's not even any sort of like a copper core in the middle. You'll find a lot of the stock coolers now that come with AMD will have an aluminum heat sink, but they'll have a, co a round copper insert, which is better at absorbing heat. It transfers it to the aluminum, and then the fan obviously firing down is cooling not only the CPU, but the components around the CPU itself. This is the same cooler, it's just twice the density which is what you would find in a higher end CPU that has more core count because more core count means more concentrated heat, which means more cooling capacity and thermal capacity is needed. So that's why you find these different sizes. But you start stepping it up to the high end CPUs, then you would get the Wraith cooler like this, which has a big heat sink, uh, fin array, plus a, this one's got four copper heat pipes, which are vapor chamber, which has a wicking technology, uh, which is going to wick heat away from the CPU to the top of the fin array, and then same thing, a down firing fan, which will blow air through the heat sink and cool the components around it. We have preached for a long time now that these coolers are definitely more than enough for somebody building a computer, turning it on, not planning on overclocking it or doing any sort of custom clocks or anything to it. Remember the CPUs were designed around these coolers that they're included with. Any cooling capacity that you add above that only applies headroom for overclocking or turning on precision boost overdrive uh, with AMD or turning on any of the higher end boost uh, turbo features that you'd find on Intel, which would require then a higher end air cooler at the very least, or potentially even a water cooler, depending on how far you're trying to overclock it. And the biggest thing here being the ambient temperature where you live. If you live in a colder environment, you'll find that coolers like this do the job a whole lot better. If it's always chilly in your room because you live up in Canada or something, uh, where you get 
only a few warm months, but you get a lot of cold winter months, you'll find that you don't need a super high-end cooler just because the ambient temperature is better. But if you live in, say, Phoenix, Arizona, or down, down somewhere where it's super humid and hot, like, say, the Pacific, um, you know, the Pacific Southwest, or even, like, Florida, or something like that, then you'll find you definitely are going to need to overcome the heat by putting a bigger cooler on there. So don't listen to people when they say the stock cooler is garbage because that's an old mentality that's just kind of not aged well. The next thing I hear people talking about quite often, uh, if it's obvious that they haven't been using modern hardware, is going to be defragmenting your drive. Defragmenting is something that is specific to spinner drives, uh, some sort of a platter. Defragging an SSD, whether it be a two and a half inch SSD or a SATA SSD or an NVMe SSD is actually bad for it. SSDs are rated to certain reads and writes. Uh, they've got, a, they've got a, a lifespan. And that lifespan is entirely in, uh, dependent on the amount of times it's, those sectors have been written and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. And when you defrag, it's doing an awful lot of reads and writes at the same time and moving data around in different sectors of the drive. The reason why they do that on spinning drives is because about, uh, it's about drive health. And defragmenting is about, uh, well, I'm not gonna get into defragmenting in the way it works because it's quite honestly not something most people have to worry about today unless you're still running an OS on the spinning drive itself. But you hear people all the time talking about, my computer seems slow, what, what should I do? And I see it all the time. People recommending, defrag your drive. And it's like, what year is this? You do not, I repeat, do not defragment an SSD. In fact, uh, I believe there's even a warning now uh, in Windows that says defragmenting on an SSD is not recommended for the specific reasons that I just stated. If you have an SSD, it's going to automatically read and write as you install programs and uninstall programs. It's, it's gonna use smart technology to read and write on the sectors and keep the drive healthy fast and accessible. But that's not the case on spinning, spinning platters. Spinning platters are physically written on a certain part of the platter and then as it goes past the needle, it's red. And that requires things to be constantly defragged and rewritten and moved around the drive manually. And by manually, that's what we mean by defragmentation. I only have one fan here for demonstration, but when I first started my YouTube channel, especially with the fact that I was really creating a name for myself in the water cooling space, Fan types. Fan types, whether it be static pressure or airflow, was something that was highly debated and something I fought quite hard against people over-exaggerating the benefit of a static pressure fan versus an airflow fan. Back when I started my channel 10 years ago, there was a very active campaign with various manufacturers of fans advertising these fans are perfect for water cooling and these fans are perfect for air cooling. Specifically had everything to do with the way that the fan blades were designed. Um, bearing types played a role depending on the orientation of the fan. Is it this way? Is it this way? Is it this way? And depending, and we've already had done a whole video about fan types and bearing types. Um, the orientation of the fan could affect the lifespan of the bearing. That aside, when it comes to static pressure versus airflow, that has everything to do with the fin design. And almost every single fan on the market now is a hybrid between what you would have found as a airflow fan, designed for case fans, moving air through less restrictive spaces, whether it be a mesh fan grill uh, or a, a fan filter, into an open space behind it versus a radiator which is going to have to move through the same things I just mentioned, plus the additional thickness and resistance of the radiator fins, determining what type of fan you would place in that spot. Uh, I, tons and tons of people back in the day would argue with me that you can't put airflow fans on a radiator. Yes, you can. It wasn't as efficient because of the fact that you would get some splashback because of the fact that the fins on airflow fans are separated. They don't overlap in any way. Whereas you can see right here, looking straight on this fan, there's a little bit of a gap between the fins, but this is definitely a hybrid between an airflow style fan and a static pressure style fan. They absolutely could get the job done. Nowadays, you just, you don't, fan marketing is no longer about airflow and static pressure. It's all about RGB. So we sort of matured and moved on in fan design 
and realize now people are buying fans based on aesthetics and based on whether that be RGB, are they white? Are they silent in the motor design, the hub design, the bearing design? Do they have isolator pads? So if you see people arguing fan types, whether it be cases, radiators, or heat sinks like on your CPU cooler, uh, ignore the argument. Absolutely ignore the argument. All fans today are light years beyond, no pun intended with RGB fans, are light years beyond what they were even 10 years ago. And you put what fan matches your aesthetic and your needs in terms of acoustics and design over the argument of static pressure or airflow. Because anyone still arguing that is definitely stuck in the old, the old days. Let's talk power supplies for a moment. This is one where a lot of people still kind of get caught up on wattage rating versus 80 plus. 80 plus 10 years ago was really just starting to become understood and recognized uh, amongst consumers and power supplies. 80 plus, anything 80% 80 80 efficient, which is 80 plus means, uh, is, is incredibly inefficient by today's standards. It's just funny that it became the 80 plus standard. Like realistically, it should be the 90 plus standard now because pretty much everything is at least gold rating. We had 80 plus, which now they just, it was like white, right? So you have 80 plus, you have 80 plus bronze, which is rare these days, 80 plus silver, which is all but extinct, 80 plus gold, which is what I feel like most of the motherboard or uh, power supplies are today, 80 plus platinum and 80 plus titanium. And all that it refers to is the uh, efficiency of the unit itself. How much of the wall power being pulled is actually being converted into power for the PC. So if something was 80 plus efficient, that means if you were pulling a thousand watts from the wall, only 800 watts of it is going to get to the system. So which means to get the full thousand watts of your power supply, you would actually be pulling 1200 watts from the wall, essentially, because the power supply itself's efficient rating is 20% inefficient, if that makes sense. Now we're up in the 91, 92, 93, up to the 96% range, which is titanium. And what you're gonna find is that the quality of power supplies today is, is far exceeds uh, 10 years ago. 10, 15 years ago, people were still actually buying cases that came with the silver generic, who knows what power supply it, and using it. That's because of the fact that as CPU core counts and the GPU density, the higher end CPU or GPUs and the TDPs of modern GPUs for sure have gone up, so have the reliability and the efficiency ratings of the power supplies. Now reliability and the 80 plus rating of power supply, personally for me, those are completely linear. The higher the, the 80 plus rating of a power supply, the higher efficient or the higher quality parts that are inside of it, the capacitors, the inverter, the entire build design is higher, which is how they're able to get that more efficient rating. So you can pretty much directly correlate a higher rated power supply, not wattage, but the, the, the 80 plus rating of it, directly correlates to the build quality of the power supply. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that rule. And there are power supplies that sometimes might have a faulty component in them uh, that may have made their way through manufacturing and then you got a capacitor going bad or something like that. We have seen that happen with certain power supplies, although they are high rated. That is more of a manufacturing defect than the power supply parts itself as a whole being a problem. But it's one of those things where I see people all the time saying, well, should I get a higher watt power supply or should I get a higher rated power supply? And I see a lot of folks on forums and stuff and Reddit just saying, get a higher wattage power supply. Because the old adage of that one is if you're only an 80 plus bronze, which is like, I believe it's something around 85% efficient, maintaining a lower usage of the max wattage of the power supply would keep you in that higher peak of the bell curve on the efficiency rating. Because most power supplies were most efficient right around 60, 65% usage. So if your system drew 600 watts at max power draw, when we're talking like the GPU is firing, the CPU is in a pretty heavy load, it's using a lot of memory, um, all your fans are kicked up, and your, power, and your CPU could peak 550, 600 watts, then getting yourself a thousand watt power supply would keep you in the top end of that bell curve in terms of the efficiency rating. But that bell curve has changed over the years where it's much more flat at the top now. So instead of going up and having a steep fall off near its max wattage rating, they now go up and stay much higher. So it's more or less a, I don't know, it's, it's not really a bell, it's more of a wave curve. It comes up and then it kind of stays flat at the top with a little rip curl at the end. So that's no longer uh, sound advice. It's something I've preached on my channel back in the day as well. 
if my system used 800 watts, I would get a 1600 watt power supply because of the fact that it would stay at 50 to 60% rating. I was also running two, three graphics cards at the time. I was running triple SLI uh, or three-way SLI. Uh, and it was a much different need back then versus today. But with power supplies now being built to a much different standard than they were 10 years ago, you really don't have to truly exceed your power supply and your system's needs by a whole lot. I would still recommend if you were pulling 600 watts on your system, maybe getting an 800 watt power supply. Having headroom is always a good idea. Your power supply can deliver power beyond its rating though. However, it's a very steep efficiency fall off curve as well as a very high increase in temperatures and load on the power supply, which is absolutely going to reduce its life cycle. If your power supply is constantly being asked to deliver more power than its max rating and its max amps, you're gonna constantly trip OCP or overcurrent protection inside the power supply. Your system's gonna shut down all the time and you're just gonna be mad. So I would stay within 100 to 200 watts of your max system rating by oversizing your power supply by 200 watts at the most. The last one we're gonna talk about here um, refers more to your setup than your actual um, PC itself, and that is to run a powered USB hub to connect all your stuff to. That was fine before USB-C or USB 3.1 or even USB 3.0 became a true standard. Let me explain. When devices were, like webcams weren't 4K, or 1080p 60 FPS with ISO settings and aperture settings and, and having a lot of data going back and forth. Now you've got your keyboards and your mice, which are actually sending very fast polling rates or your Elgato stream decks and capture cards and such. You could have a, a, a hub, no problem. Maybe have an external drive hooked up to it. Maybe have a charger hooked up to it for your phone. And that's, that's just a power signal, not a data signal, but still things that are gonna be drawing power from a powered hub. What you'll start finding is devices not working properly when using a hub. Now a hub was a, was a great piece of advice for cleaning up your setup. But I myself even have had to stop using hubs at home because hooking up a, a Logitech or an Elgato face cam or something for my live stream uh, would not work properly because the hub, remember, has to take that signal and then it has to basically act like a USB router, if you will, and then it connects to one line going into one port on your system. That's asking a lot in terms of the data, either between that line to the hub, the hub itself, or that single port. Now, although most devices don't seem like they could saturate, even a single USB 3.0, you'll find that having just the hub, nothing else attached to it, and putting a modern webcam on that hub will not communicate correctly with OBS or its own software. You have to connect it directly to the system. So hubs are something that uh, even for plugging in keyboard and mice these days is just, I think we need to see true, and I mean true USB-C or Thunderbolt hubs uh, exist. I mean, they do exist, but they are, they, I've still had an issue where my USB-C, um, true USB-C hub is still not able to power and carry the signal from my USB-C webcam. So it's one of those things where you might end up finding yourself frustrated trying to get your setup going, spending a lot of time troubleshooting why certain things in your system and your setup aren't working, whether it be keyboard, mouse, webcam, Elgato Stream Deck, or any other streaming device. Isn't You're trying to figure out why it's not working, and the issue is the hub and not the actual device itself. So although this video might have seemed like a lot of common sense to uh, a lot of people, they, we have more new people entering the PC space, although I know it doesn't seem like it with how difficult it is to buy stuff. We have more people entering the scene now, building their first computers or building their first computer in 10 plus years than we've ever seen before. So if this advice can save someone from making a bad decision or following some very poorly outdated advice, some of which exists on this channel because things have changed since I've started my channel until now, I thought it was important to put out an updated video talking about things that have just changed and are not worth listening to today in 2022, where they might've made sense in 2012. Anyway, guys, thanks for listening. Put your best advice down below that counteracts or contradicts the advice you were given years ago because the situation has changed. Thanks for watching, guys. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.